All right. So uh, as a quick recap from the uh, from the last uh, last class that we had, which was pretty much yesterday. Where are we here? All right. So these two questions we should know the answers to. Right now here, there we go. Uh, when it comes to characteristic impedance, uh, all right. So will the characteristic impedance change if the total length of the coaxial cable or link changes? Does it depend on the length of the cable? Yes or no, somebody? No, it doesn't. There we go. Marty, thank you. All right. Um, and for the most part, it is equal to, if you remember what I was saying uh, yesterday, the characteristic impedance is equal to impedance of what length of the cable? Just as a general rule. Nobody, okay. Um, as a general rule, uh, for the most part, the characteristic impedance of coaxial cable is equal to the impedance of the first meter. The characteristic impedance is the characteristic impedance is equal to the first meter of the cable. As a general rule, right? Approximately. Yeah. And again here, uh, another one, the second question, why do we need to match the impedances as we interface different parts of the whole transmission system? So we're interfacing, uh, let's say, output of a transmitter to a cable, and let's say we're in interfacing the cable on the other end to, let's say, antenna. Why do we need to match the impedances? You can say it on voice if you want. Or you can just type. Anybody? Come on, wake up, guys. I know it's 10 o'clock, but maximize the power transfer. There we go. Thank you, Marty, again. All right. So uh, the answer is for the maximum to accomplish the maximum power transfer. And not only that, because if you mismatch the impedances, in some cases, you can actually damage the equipment. All right, cool. All right, now, uh, also as a recap from last time here, let's see, you see the nice thing here? Uh, where's the graph that I had? This one here, all right. So if we have two um, components like this here, right? Um, a capacitor, if we have a capacitor with the value of 100 microfarads and we have con uh, inductor with the inductance of 100 millihenries, and if we apply the frequency of 50.4 Hertz to them. Here's, we're going to get that black dot, all right? So that black dot is uh, the resonant frequency for these two components, right? What happens uh, at the re resonant frequency? What is that we're accomplishing? All right. What is what is equal to what? You can actually look at the graph and tell what's equal to what. <laughs> there are two things that are equal for these two parts. Ding, 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 ding. Impedances equals yeah. So you can see the impedances, or uh, for this, uh, um, to be more exact, it's the um, uh, uh, reactances. Okay. So if those reactances are equal, and let's say we have a circuit like this. So they are equal in magnitude, but they oppose, oppose each other. Right? So, just so we get the clear understanding on things, if we have a circuit consisting of a resistor, 
and here's going to be the current, here's going to be the resistance R, here is the voltage V. What is going to be the current value of this, uh, of this circuit, the current I? Remember the Ohm's law? The the um, the best way to remember Ohm's law is there, right? So there you go. So if you want to derive the current, we have to divide both parts, both uh, sides of the equation by R. Right? So. I equals V over R. And that's going to be V1 here over R1. Okay. So here is the $64 question. And no, I don't have $64 to pay you. Uh, that's my eraser here. Well, if we do this, we put a coil here. And we put a capacitor here. And instead of the, um, well, let's say this is a AC source. Okay. So at any given moment, when you when you stop when you freeze things in time if these two l1 and c1 when we get the frequency to the point that we establish a resonant frequency here and if you stop in time at any given moment what is going to be the current equal to? And remember, we have resonant frequency here. Get your thinking caps on. Let me give you a hint. What's the point of me producing myself, giving it all the lecture, if uh, you can't apply that to the reality right now? In resonant frequency, the inductive reactance is equal to the capacitive reactance, and they are pointing opposite ways. So, what is going to be the value of the current in this circuit at the resonant frequency? if you stop that in time. So it's going to be sort of like a momentary DC supply. I'll give it a couple, like a few more seconds. And if not, I'll let you think about it and we'll take care of it next time. No, nobody. Okay. So I will leave you with this thought for the weekend. Okay. Cool. All right, let's just uh, keep going with this, uh, with the second part of the coaxial cable, uh, so we can uh, we can wrap this and put this one to bed. All right. All right. So here is the next slide, and I will post the whole thing right after this class. Uh, I'll just have to make sure that uh, all the mistakes are fixed. All right, so RG, you remember that RG stands for re, uh, radio guide, right? There's another R similar to RG, it's RJ, and that stands for registered jack, has nothing to do with this. This is RG, stands for radio guide, and it is applied to some not coaxial cable. 
All right. So, and as uh, uh, if you remember from yesterday, what I said was that those numbers are G59, are G6, are G11, and whatnot. They have nothing to do with any of the specifications of that cable. It's just that those numbers are grabbed from the air and assigned to the RG as the cables were developed at the time. So they said, well, is number 59 free? Is there any RG 15? No, okay, let's call this one 59. All right. Something like that, all right? So, um, all right, so let's take a look at the RG6 first because this is the one that you can uh, relate to as far as uh, being able to see it, being able to touch that. Uh, this will be the cable uh, that is provided to your home if you have a cable modem or so-called cable modem. So this will be the black cable, well, sometimes blue or white, uh, but uh, for the most part it's black. And that will be the thickness and that will be the size of that cable. So RG6, what, what are the uses for that? Well, internet, and uh, I put that in orange here, broadband, and we'll talk about what that is in the next few slides. Uh, so, uh, well, in the past, mostly in the past, uh, it was used widely for the uh, cable television, by the cable television providers. In fact, it was installed for the purpose of providing the cable television. And that was working quite well until, let's say, mm, early 2000s. All right when uh, when the cable TV became uh, still, it's uh, being provided by the same cable, but it's not analog; it's digital now. So then that gives us the possibility of installing other media to provide uh, to provide the television through other media. And some of the TV is uh, being provided uh, by the telephone lines. Still, the technology has uh, the equipment has advanced that much that you can have a cable TV by by the telephone cable. Uh, a lot of fiber optics is being used right now, right? But now, why do we have that internet uh, provided by the cable, even though there's the main fiber, the other main fiber lines uh, pulled into or installed in the neighborhood? It is because the network is still there, the network of cable. Those cables are pulled and installed already there. So the fiber optic lines are being pulled to some sort of centralized point. And then from there, the, uh, the signal is being transferred by a whole bunch of, what else, media converters uh, to uh, transfer that to the um, cable TV or the RG6 or sometimes RG11. And we'll talk about why uh, sometimes RG11, RG6. All right, uh, CCTV was used for, um, well, it's, CCTV stands for closed circuit television. And uh, some of the older systems would use two cables from the camera to the recording equipment or the display equipment. One would be the coaxial cable and the other one would be power. And sometimes the cable was produced in uh, something that's called a Siamese, a Siamese cable, just like Siamese twins. Um, and that cable would consist of the coaxial cable and right to the jacketing, it was molded another jacketing that would contain, uh, well, let's say uh, um, 16 gauge or 18 gauge stranded uh, pair uh, to provide the power. Right? So that would be the older ones. You can still see some of them. Um, and it's very, well, if, if you buy a new system for the like CCTV, like for example, for the most part, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's security cameras. Uh, or security surveillance, video surveillance, um, you can still, uh, some distributors will still carry the old analog uh, recording equipment um, because some companies, they don't want to pay still the, the money to re-pull or reinstall new ethernet cabling. Uh, if the system goes down, they are happy with what they have. And you know what, what client says, goes so client wants this and if you don't install that for the client he's going to try to call somebody else and somebody else is going to make money so some of that old equipment is still available as new right but it's going to be becoming less and less and less now rg6 also is being used for antennas to provide signal from transmitters to antennas and here's the thing 
there's a frequency limit, which is the bandwidth of the cable, which means how much frequency can it handle? What does that mean, frequency limit? Is how high frequency you can pass through this, a signal under how high frequency you can pass through this cable, so it is still understood as a signal on the other end. So the frequency limit of RG6 is 1000 megahertz. And in brackets, I put one gigahertz because 1000 megahertz is one gig. However, it just so happens that in, when it comes to the field of installing the coaxial cable and uh, the technical jargon associated with that, uh, it was pretty much for the most part specified in megahertz, so you don't have to convert the units. Blah, blah, blah. So, 1000 megahertz, which is one gig, right? And I got this. Here is what we talked about for the whole hour yesterday. Characteristic impedance of that is 75 ohms. And look at the other characteristic impedances RG59, 75 ohms. RG6, 75 ohms. RG11, 75 ohms. RG50, oh, 50 ohms. Right? So it's either 75 or 50. That's uh, well, that's that's how the industry kind of uh, stayed that way. Now, why 50? Because it started with the 50 ohms. If you really want to know the historical background behind that, and if this is something that excites you, when you download this presentation, by all means, click on that um, click on that link. And if you don't have the download, just you have to just type that address. And there's a nice gentleman that is going to explain that thing to you. I found it somewhere. Uh, so I said, hey, I'm going to share it with you. All right. All right. So RG6, we're looking at the characteristic impedance for whatever purpose we want to use. And we're looking at the bandwidth just to make sure that whatever this thing is that we're installing with, uh, it's not going to exceed that. If it exceeds that, then we, maybe we should use a different cable. And look at these two, RG59 and RG6. They both have characteristic impedance of 75 ohms, and they both have frequency limit of 1000 megahertz. So what gives? Why do we have two different cables? Well, there's a reason for that. And we'll get to it. There are other specifications. There are other characteristics of the cable. So our G59 was pretty much used for pretty much the same thing. Uh, can a cable have 50 gigahertz or what's the highest uh, that it goes? Well, that's for us to find out. Uh, the biggest one that I have worked with was 3000 megahertz or three gigs. Uh, I don't think that coaxial cable can have, actually, you know what? No, maybe it is because some of the, uh, there are some of the coaxial cables that are highly industrial, they have highly industrial um, use. And I'm, you know, to be honest, I'm going to have to check the MP, uh, the bandwidth on uh, on that because there are some cables that are providing a signal to the antenna and they would be like two inches thick all right uh, and there would be those uh, those big radio stations um, uh, and uh, there is no dielectric per se there's no polymer dielectric between the center core and the outer shield the outer shield is one solid piece of aluminum uh, and uh, the center core is copper and there are spacers there. So the dielectric is air. Uh, so that's, uh, I imagine that would be much higher frequency limit. And let me check, uh, let me check for that. Okay, I'll get back to you on that one. All right. I don't want to give you a kind of, I don't want to make up an answer uh, and uh, give you a wrong information. All right. Are there multiple types of optical fiber like are there multiple types of optical fiber like there is coaxial? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're different. See, for the fiber optics, um, we'll we'll get to that when we get to it. But uh, for the most part, it it is the well, it is the core 
which is certain size. There is some nut cladding, which is surrounds the core, which is certain size. And it's two pieces of glass melted together over a long period, long, long distance. And what makes the fiber optic cables different is the size of the core. So you can have multi-mode or single mode. And everything else is the jacketing, depending on where this thing is going to be installed and how it's going to be used. All right, so <clears throat> we get the um, RG59 and RG6, which are very similar. Both of these here, RG59 and RG58, are being used in amateur radio as well. You can still use RG6, 75 ohms. So if you have a transmitter that works with 75 ohms, you should use the 75 ohm uh, cable. But that's when, it's, uh, when it comes to amateur radio, from what I know, most of the transceivers, which is transmitter and receiver, are 50 ohms. So 50 ohm cable should be used. And this would be the cable that provides the signal from the transmitter or receiver or the transceiver to the antenna. OK, uh, and it is important that those impedances are matched, not only uh, for the purpose of maximum power transfer, which is a huge one, but also uh, if you use the wrong impedance, if you mismatch the impedance, you're going to end up with um, heat losses and that heat is mostly going to go into the transceiver so you can actually damage the equipment. All right. Now. The RG11 and RG6 are very similar for the, uh, uh, for the, as far as applications, except in here you can see that it has a higher frequency limit. Uh, this one has 1000 megahertz, this one has 3000 megahertz, so three times as much, but there are other characteristics that we're going to take a look at, uh, which let's say is going to tell you the difference between this one and that one. Oh yeah, well, here's the 5,000 megahertz. Uh, sorry, so here's the 5,000 megahertz for a G58. Right. And, uh, oh, I'm just gonna have to look at this because now, now it's gonna bug me uh, uh, when it comes to those uh, big transmission antennas for like big radio stations. Right. Uh, well, in fact, if you drive out, um, I think it's, Wellington and Highbury. Uh, towards south, you're going to see the Regina Mandy uh, High School. And right by that, there's going to be some big antennas for our radio stations. And those antennas are being supplied with the coaxial cable. That big, all right? There we go. Um, OK, so let's get to the next slide. We just have the three cables here. And if you want to know for RG58, you can still get this thing whenever. What do we have here? On the left side, we have a frequency. And the frequency grows as we approach the bottom of the table. So here we have 5 megahertz, 55 megahertz, and so on. Just chunks of frequency. All right, over here we have RG59 and we have contestant number two, RG6, and we have contestant number three, RG11. And over here we have the loss per 100 feet. Or if you prefer, loss per 100 meters. But Let's not complicate things too much because we're trying to get the concept of things. You can apply the same principle if you want to use feet or meters. And you have something that's called the dB decibels. See, we're, when I explain something to you, I always leave you with more to explore. More to explore, it rhymes. All right, so <clears throat> what the heck does that mean? Okay. Let's see here. A dB, in short, a decibel is something that's called a referential value. 
It always has to be compared to something. And different parts of the industry use different units to compare things to. So you have to dig deep and find out you know, it's a dB compared to what, okay? But the decibel scale enables us to graph curves that would normally take maybe thousand meters long to graph things the way we want to because there's such a big span of the values. But that lets us graph those things in, let's say, in the letter size paper. That's why we are using the dBs. And we can see the changes better or the responses of whatever we are graphing using the decibel scale. So when we're talking dBs, and we're talking loss. All right, I'm just gonna give you a couple formulas here and I'm not going to test you on that, but I just want you to know what's going on. Erase this wonderful thing here. All right. Oh, let's get a pencil. When it comes to power the value of the decibel is equal to 10 times log of whatever the and I'm just going to put a V, but it's going to be confusing. I just want so you know what. It, okay, okay. So let's go P for power. Power, whatever of whatever we have, over the power of reference, and I'm going to call power zero. Compared to something. When it comes to power, when it comes to voltage, because. Uh, And if you're going to work with oscilloscopes and whatnot, you'll, you'll be able to display voltage. And sometimes you will be asked to raise the voltage so many dBs or so on. So you can quickly calculate what that is. The dB, so this will be the B for power. I'm just gonna put that in brackets. And the dB for voltage is equal to 20 log or the voltage whatever we have we're dealing with compared to the voltage of reference so this would be the two formulas if you want to quickly remember those you will be dealing with that sooner or later what does this mean if you know, uh, maybe someone can, if you're interested in uh, deriving this formula, there's a bunch of information that you can just find anywhere pretty much. And then also, what does that mean? When it comes to power, if you, you, if you raise 3 dB, 3 dB difference in power, if you raise the power three decibels, you have doubled the power. If you lower the power three decibels by three decibels, you have cut the power in half as far as the well, power, yeah. So if you have whatever producing, anything that has power of 100 watts, it could be, well, let's say you got a bunch of loudspeakers, PA system pumping up 100 watts. Raise that power 3 dB, then you got 200 watts. Then you take that 200 watts, raise it 3 dB, you got 400 watts, and so on. And it goes the other way as well. So that's as far as power. Power 3 dB. Okay. And just for your own information uh, that you can use later, for the voltage, the number is not three, but six. Uh, 
right? So if you are going to double the voltage, you're going to raise it six decibels. If you want to cut the voltage in half, you're going to lower it by six decibels. And here, just as a something interesting to know, here's the power and the 3 dB. It actually has to do something with our human ears. When you have the volume control on your stereo, in order for you to hear the difference. So for the most part, for, for most our regular folk, if you touch the volume control enough to hear the difference in volume, that would probably be three decibels. So if you ever so slightly touch and you don't hear the difference, then you haven't done three dB. So the, the probably the lowest noticeable difference that we are humans are able to detect in volume as far as power would be 3 db right. just something to now back to this table here because we have the dbs the loss or attenuation attenuation is a signal deterioration as it travels down whatever link So we have the three cables and let's see what their losses are. Because you see the RG6 and RG59 over here are pretty much the same specifics, same specifications. So why do we have three, two different cables? Well, here's the answer. Oh, come on, my mouse. There you go. Um, it's the loss in the cable per length. So you can see that our G59 is the well, lowest, I don't want to say quality, but it will have the biggest loss of the signal per 100 feet out of these three. Let's take a look at, let's say, 5 megahertz. Our G59 will have 0.89 dBs, decibels, loss, signal loss, per every 100 feet. And now when I say that 0 0.89 decibels, because I showed you that 3 decibels, half power or double power, now it's, it's giving you some sort of better understanding of what the dB losses are, whatever the signal is or reference. So you could have a signal coming in to the uh, to the cable of uh, well, let's say thirty decibels compared to whatever the initial value is that is set by the standards of the company that is providing it, and if you have hundred feet. At 211 megahertz, you have lost more than half of the uh, signal. Now look at this. At the higher frequency, you lost 16 decibels. So that's a lot of power being lost. Notice that the freak, as the frequency goes up at the same cable, the loss also goes up or the attenuation goes up. All right. So that's one thing I want you to remember. Look, the cables, coaxial cable, higher frequencies don't have that much punch power to travel further distances as the lower frequencies have. The lower frequencies have more meat on them. It just goes like a bulldozer and it's hard to stop. The tiny frequencies, yeah, they are going to walk, but they're going to lose their power quicker than the higher frequencies. So something to remember, not all frequencies in the cable are being attenuated at the same rate. And then we have different cables here. So let's say we have, uh, well, a bit of a longer distance to cover 
is RG59 going to be enough for what we're going to use? Well, maybe not. So let's see what else we have. Oh, we have RG6 and it has less loss per 100 feet than RG59 because for 500 megahertz, it has 0 0.89 dB per 100 feet, but this one is just 0 0.69 dB per 100 feet. Oh, look at this, RG11 is uh, even better because look, this one has 0 0.89 per 100 feet loss, dBs, and this one's just 0 0.38 per 100 feet. Oh. But again, this cable is way more expensive than this cable. And sometimes if you don't need that, you can get away with this. Of course, you're going to buy RG59. So different cables would have different losses depending on how they are made and how expensive they are. And in every cable, higher frequencies deteriorate quicker than the lower frequencies. You can see by this pattern here. You can see it by this pattern right here. And you can see it by this pattern right here when it comes to feet. And per 100 meters, it's just a different number, but the same principle. All right. OK, my mouse is really becoming funny here. I got to change my mouse because my wheel is getting crazy on me. To use the buttons on the keyboard. All right, what do we have here in the next uh, thing here? We have, uh, well, frequencies. What frequencies are we dealing with? The cable TV, when it was there, they will be divided by channels. And in cable TV, each channel would occupy six megahertz to insert the video signal, the audio signal, some synchronization signal, whatever control signals that were there, you got six megahertz to play with and you can press those carriers within that. Next channel is going to be next, next, or yeah, yeah. next channel is gonna be next six megahertz. And next channel is going to be next six megahertz and so on. So channel two will occupy the frequencies between 54 and 60 megahertz. Oh, channel six. Um, would be 82 to 88 megahertz. And look, channel 13, for example, will be 210 to 216 megahertz. If you really want to see that, there's that slide right there, North American television frequencies. You can see what the frequencies were for the cable TV. There's many channels there, right? Okay, and this one here uh, is just a reference uh, of the general television frequencies. So VHF band, uh, low band, mid band. Uh, it's just so you know that something like that existed or maybe still exists. But uh, the, um, well, the cable television is being kind of phased out on the account of the digital signal providers. But I just want you to know the principles of the coaxial cable. All right, so sometimes you're going to see some of the older still in existence um, CCTVs, which would be the closed circuit television systems. And how does that work? It works like this. Erase this thing here. There would be an amplifier that would get the signal, let's say, from the city of strength of a certain, well, signal would be certain strength. And the purpose of that amplifier is to give enough signal strength as you carry the signal, let's say, through a long hallway. And along the hallway, there would be classrooms. And those classrooms would have taps connected to that main signal. And they would 
provide the signal to the receivers and for the most part would be the television sets, all right? Okay, so over here, because we need to transfer a lot of signal with possible minimal, as minimal as possible losses over long, longer distance, well, considering because you're talking about maybe 500 feet or so, or maybe a little bit longer. So for that main vein of signal, you want the best cable possible, but it's also expensive. So for that, you would use RG11 because it has the least amount of loss. Now, for the cables that are going to the individual one, the receivers from the tops out, top outs, maybe you don't have 500 feet from here to here. Maybe you only have 40 feet from here to here. So, well, you don't need as expensive cable as this one here to provide the signal that is pretty much good quality. So the big one here, the main cable, you could use RG11. And over here, you could use RG59 or RG6, but for the most part, because the prices are quite similar. So you know, RG6 is a little bit better. So you could use RG6, RG6 for these here. So that's how it works. Now, if you look at this here, Remember this table? It is per 100 feet. So if it's 500 feet, you have to multiply that by whatever, five, for example, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is notice the frequencies are not attenuated at the same rate. So the higher frequencies won't have as much power to travel to the end of the cable as the lower frequencies would. So at the end of the cable, you could have good quality low channels, but the high channels would be snowy. So that's why we have something that's called a distribution amplifier or RF amplifier or radio frequency amplifier. And what do we have as inputs and outputs and controls for that? Very simple thing, but not cheap. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so here we have the input that the signal will be coming in from wherever it comes in. And here will be the outputs to distribute along the main hallway, the main vein, the main signal river, all right? And here's our volume control, so to speak. This is the gain control. And the gain control decides how much to amplify the whole signal. And over here at the input stage and at the output stage of the amplifier, you have test outputs. So it'll be the input signal test and you would connect a television set here to see if you have signal coming in from the city. You don't want to connect it here because the signal will be too strong for the television set to handle. And you can either burn the circuitry of the TV or you are not going to have a proper signal strength by the, for, for, for the tuner to handle and it might display some of the channels incorrectly as far as quality. So that's why, because it's a strong signal, the test output of the input is lowered 20 dBs, so you can comfortably view it on the regular television set. Same thing on the output. Signal is lowered 20 dB, so you can comfortably, comfortably see it on the regular television set. And here's the mysterious tilt control. Sometimes it is called a slope. Same thing. 
them. Some companies call it tilt. Some companies call it slope. Remember this table? Different frequencies are attenuated in the cable at different rate. So at the end of this cable, the lower frequencies would be still okay. And the higher frequencies would be, would have not enough power because they deteriorate faster. So here is the remedy for that. Adjust the slope of amplification. So at the, right at the output of this big distribution amplifier, you bump up, you bump this frequency, higher frequencies up. So they're amplified more at the go than the lower frequencies. And as the signal travels down the cable, they, at some point, they're going to be equally, you know, they're going to equalize, right? Equalize themselves. So this way, the frequencies, higher frequencies can travel as far as the lower frequencies. So that's the slope. All right, now we're coming towards the end of the time that is allowed for us. And I still have to cover something else. So if you have somewhere to go, uh, please go. Then you can catch the ending on um, not when I do, when I post this thing on YouTube. Right? But I'm just going to continue, even if everybody leaves. All right. And if you have to go, then uh, have a wonderful weekend. All right. Uh, those who stay can stay. Well, you're welcome to stay. I need to finish this uh, lesson here. All right. All right. So let's see here. Um, what we have. I already talked about this slide. Now we're going to cover something that's called the broadband connection. Remember when I showed you the uses of the coaxial cables? And one of them was internet. And in brackets, I put broadband. As opposed to dial up. What's the difference between broadband and dial-up? Or, as a matter of fact, what is the difference between broadband and baseband? That's what we're going to talk about right now. So let's take care of first things first. Broadband, in, broadband internet service is the most used for form of internet access because of its high speed. much higher than what it used to be with the dial-up connection. Dial-up connection to the internet was at the beginning when the internet became available to general public. And you're talking sometime around 1993, 1994, that's when the internet was beginning to exist in people's well not exactly in people's homes yet maybe 95 or 6 that's when people were getting you know the internet was becoming more popular uh in 1993 94 schools and some other institutions would be introduced to the idea of internet before then there was no internet well there was but not available to us You were high speed when you had 56, yeah, <laughs> 56 modem. Yeah, I remember those. And I remember the sound of that still, um, of the connection. Now, that was a dial-up modem. Is this already uh, gone? No, that is still, believe it or not, those dial-up modems are still, in some cases, are being used. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how. I'll tell you how. But the difference in speed between the dial-up modem and the broadband is huge. And just to give you some understanding, what do you get uh, when you want to see, while well, you Google some images of whatever, like uh, you're researching some subject, and you're going to click on the images. 
how long does it take to load the image? Well, pretty much bang, it's there. And with the dial-up modem, just to load one picture, sometimes it will take 20 minutes or sometimes longer, depending on the resolution of the picture. <laughs> so that's the difference in speed. Huh? Um, if you right now, if you want to download a song or something, it takes you, well, a minute, maybe less. And then download a song, oh, wow, long time. But that was, you know, it was considered high tech at that time. And that was okay. All right. Interface, in, so internet is offered in four different forms. DSL, fiber optic cable, satellite. DSL stands for digital subscriber line. And that's the internet that is given to you over the telephone lines, DSL. Fiber optics, fiber optic. Cable is the one that we're talking about through coaxial cable and satellite is, you know, satellite through the air. And the old dial-up connection is the only non-broadband. So as we go along, the whole, the broadband thing is going to be demystified. So I'm just going to keep using that word just to irritate you. Yeah, all right. Uh, the old dial-up modem is the only non-broadband internet service available. And even though it is cheaper, most internet users are moving towards the faster broadband internet connection. This is a funny statement, but because are not, we are not moving, that's what we have, all right? But that still exists, all right. Also, things for you to know, for us to know. Um, internet signal, here's an internet signal, is being provided to us from the outside in an analog form, just like radio waves. And it is delivered to us in a way that is in a frequency division multiplexing, which is broadband, and we're going to analyze what that is. Once the internet hits, the internet signal coming from outside hits the modem, and modem, modem stands for modulating, demodulating modem, right? It's being transferred into the digital form towards the inside of our house. And we're calling it the ethernet. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. Let's demystify the broadband slash baseband type of uh, uh, signal delivery. Is baseband a group of people that uh, made a music band and they just play bass guitars that would be funny um anyways no all right so let's look at the broadband connection here on the bottom of the screen we have a an example of broadband transmission and over here we have an example of uh, baseband transmission this one uses frequency division multiplexing this one uses time division multiplexing. What are the differences? Here is the multiplexer that combines the signals delivered to it and sends it down the cable. This is one cable. And I just specified channel one, channel two, channel three, but there could be hundreds of channels. Okay. And here is the multiplexer or sorry, the demultiplexer that undoes what this one did. So you could have this signal transmitted on that one link, decoded or demultiplexed, and connected to certain specific output. And this one, that one, and then whatever, okay? 
but in the frequency division multiplexing, all signals are present in the link at once. They're just present all the time. Some of us might remember some of the old television, cable television um, service when you had the TV box and you would flip between channels. When you flip the channels, you would get instant channel change. The channels would be like, toom, toom. It would be like right there. Now the digital uh, cable with the digital uh, transmission, you flip and it takes about sometimes half a second for that channel to appear. Okay. But that was because the frequency division multiplexing was used. All the channels are being present in the cable all the time. How do you get the channel? How do you tune? Here's the keyword. How do you tune to the channel? Well, the demultiplexer would use a something that's called a tuner that would tune to the whatever frequency exists there. Well, it has to be there first. It would tune to the carrier frequency of whatever the carrier modulates the signal on. Right? It would tune to the frequency of that signal and it would just see that signal out of all the signals that are there. Same as if you're driving down the road and you're using your car radio, you're tuning to a specific frequency out of all the frequencies that are present in the air. Right? So that's called frequency division multiplexing. You multiplex those into one link and you demultiplex that signal to get different channels. Right? So that's the broadband. Connections are divided into channels. Each channel occupies a space within all the spectrum that the medium can handle. Which brings me to the next point. For this type of transmission, you need a cable with huge bandwidth that can handle all the frequencies from the low frequency, well, from the low frequencies to the high frequencies, and sometimes it's a lot of frequencies to cover. So you need a cable that needs to handle all that. Uh, all channels are injected into the medium at the same time. Communication between devices is established through tuning to a specific frequency. And we are talking about frequency division multiplexing, FDM. That's the broadband type of signal delivery. And that is the form in which the internet signal is provided to our houses, to our homes, to our institutions. Also, optical fiber or fiber optic is also used to deliver signals in the form of a broadband. Now let's take a look at contestant number two, baseband. In baseband, there's no channel division. Each communication link occupies all the bandwidth that the medium can handle, as opposed to this here. I just kind of put them together to, to, to have the comparison so we can compare apples to apples. And each communication link waits its turn to talk in a time-sharing manner as opposed to all of them being injected at the same time. And I put here that's no tuning is involved. Well, there's a tiny bit of tuning involved because the signal that is being transmitted, oh, my computer wants to update, not now. Um, all the signal, um, all the, the, the multiplexer and then the signal that's being transmitted, it has, it will still have certain type of like a frequency. So this here, has to be tuned, it has to be in tune with that one, the multiplexer and the demultiplexer. But that's it. Once you make them see each other, you don't switch the tuner to choose different channels. So that's why I said no tuning is involved. We're talking about time division multiplex. So let's analyze this thing here. 
as opposed to all the frequencies being, all the channels being present at all times. Over here, we have something that's called the time division multiplexing. So let's say, well, there could be many channels again, but I just put four channels. Channel A, channel B, channel C, and channel D are being fed into the multiplexer. And the multiplexer is going to say, okay, everybody lined up, you go. All right, now you go. All right, now you go. All right, now you go. All of us, okay, let's repeat. Now you go, and so on. So let's say for one second, it is going to transmit channel A. Then the next second, the whole second, it is going to transmit channel B. And then the third second, channel C. And then the fourth second, channel D. And then it's going to repeat the process. It's going to keep repeating the process, just like having a wheel with the dial, all right? That basically touches the channel. And that's how they're... So that would be a very slow time division multiplexing. Now, the demultiplexer is going to undo that, is going to be synchronized, like time synchronized with the multiplexer. Of course, it can't be at the same time because it takes a little time to for that A channel to go through the, you know, sometimes it's milliseconds, but still, it's a bit of a time. So it can't be at the same time. So you're going to receive some sort of a synchronization pulse and say, okay, start counting time from this moment. And I'm going to transmit channel A for one second. Then after that one second, whatever comes down, treat it as channel B and put it into this line. And then the third second, whatever comes down, it is considered to be information for channel C and put it into this output and so on. All right. So synchronization is required. So this here, or this, the multi, demultiplexer has to receive and unchop the signals because this one here is going to receive all of them combine and chop them into chunks. And this is going to unchop them and put them into the appropriate channels. Just so we could use one link instead of four links or 500 links for each channel. Right? That's the idea of transmission, efficiency of transmission. Right? Now, if it were a telephone conversation between this person and this person. And if the time intervals were one second for each channel, these two people would hear each other every four seconds, which would be not a very efficient and quite annoying telephone conversation, right? Because you would hear silence for three seconds and then for one second you would hear somebody talking and then silence, right? But we're not doing this thing with one second intervals. This transmission, this switching here, the time division happens extremely, let's just say, let's skip the numbers. Let's just say it happens extremely fast to the point that the switching is so fast between that, that when this person talks and this person listens, they think that they are connected with the direct cable because the time division happens extremely fast. The switching here and the switching there. So then that's why the precise synchronization is very important when time division multiplexing. So the other point I'm going to, to point you to is because in the broadband versus baseband, so this is broadband, all channels are present at the same time which means you're going to need a cable with a huge bandwidth so you could handle all the frequencies, which means the signals have to be understood at the other end. 
over here because we have the time division multiplexing. So we have one channel transmitted at a time, very fast speed of switching. This cable needs to handle only one channel because pretty much one channel is being, as far as frequency is being. So this one doesn't need as huge a bandwidth as this one does. So here's the difference between a broadband and a baseband. And if you read those again, once you download this thing, well, it's going to be demystified. All right, now let's go back to quickly, a couple last slides. Um, the dial-up connection, that's what the modem, that's a 56K modem. <laughs> right. Um, there are some sentiments for some of us associated with these because we were all fascinated, not because the internet was, was fast. We were fascinated with the fact that we have internet at that time. And there are still some of us that, well, I'm not, we're not that old yet, right? So the internet is not that old when it comes to availability to general public. Internet is old, maybe I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years old, but it was just not available to the general public and it had a little bit different form, but it was there already. Dial up modem. This is connected here. This is connected to a, well, computer, PC. So that's with this modem right here. And the other end of this modem is connected to a telephone line, but not in the DSL form that we're using right now, because with the DSL modem, you have the signal, internet signal present in the phone line, but you could still use the phone as a phone. With the dial-up modem, it would use the phone line. So that's why, because the phone line doesn't have as much bandwidth and the equipment was not fast enough. So <clears throat> the signals would have to be slowed down to the audio level signals so you could actually hear them. It would just sound like a pleasant kind of messed up music. <laughs> And those signals will be transmitted over the telephone line. So the dial-up modem would pick up the phone line, which makes it unavailable for anybody else to use, because that's it, internet is using the phone. It would dial the physical telephone number of whatever the company here is providing the internet signal. So through the telephone lines that will be connected to it, and it would occupy one of the company's telephone line. So uh, the, the good old days, sometimes you would dial the number and say, okay, line not available. All the lines are busy because maybe there was some popular website. And those websites look much different than they, they look now. Right? Uh, and once it's established this connection, you get the signal at the speed that those this modem can handle and the telephone lines can handle. So that's why it's not a broadband. You just get one type of one-to-one -one connection and that's it. It's not a broadband connection. It's a dial-up connection, direct connection. You make direct connection with that. What did I say here? Dial-up internet access is a form of internet access that uses the facilities of the public switch telephone network of course, everything has an acronym, so PSTN, to uh, establish a connection to an internet service provider, well, ISP, by dialing a telephone number of a, on a conventional telephone line, such as POTS, plain old telephone service. Dial-up connections use modems to decode audio signals into data to send to a router or a computer and to encode from the blah, 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 blah. Funny thing, if you watch some of the historical videos, uh, which I kind of I'm trying to get, well, I'm getting it back to it for the sentimental reasons. Uh, I'm talking about Commodore 64. And if you watch some of the old instructional videos, uh, wonderful videos. Um, 
and sometimes they will be uh, on television program for the young people at that time. Well, now we are kind of getting up there with the age. Um, not there yet. Eh? But um, at the end of the program, sometimes they would transmit some sort of a code and they would call it a program. So you would go, you would get your tape deck or tape recorder and put it to the speaker of the television set and record the audio transmission. It would sound like a bunch of blips going on for like three, four minutes. You would record that and then you would put the tape into your tape station on your Commodore 64 and play it back to it and the PC at that time would decode those audio signals into data and you would have a picture of a pretty flower or something. <laughs> something like that. Eh? Or sometimes you would have a simple video game. Why am I explaining this to you that this is, is this a history lesson? No, but it has some historical elements to it. Why is it not a history lesson? Because those dial-up modems are still being used, not as the main internet provider, but let's say we have a store that contains, well, many connections, consists of many internet or ethernet connections. And some of them are PCs, some of them are wireless access points, some of them are whatever, thermostat, uh, climate control, da, 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 da. And it also has, let's say, six cache registers connected to the network. And that network, remember, is connected to through the VPN to the some kind of a mainframe of the main data kind of a storage thing, manipulating thingy there, right? <clears throat> so any transaction that is done through that store, if it, which is part of the, part of the chain, um, all those transactions are being recorded or basically live are being transmitted to some kind of a main data distribution center or storage center or whatnot. Um, also, the cash registers have the so-called money machines, what they call the money machines. I don't want to use the name of the a few brands. I don't want to use brands here, names, because there's no advertisement here. So we're going to call it money machine. It will be the pen pad that you run your credit card or debit card. So there'll be debit terminal or credit card. So let's say money terminal, money machine. That is also connected to a network. So whatever the transaction is made, the information from the cash register goes together with the separate information that's being sent by the money machine. And somewhere there, they are being manipulated in the way, but the whole thing goes through a network. And it happens very fast. Let's say that the, net, the internet goes down. And sometimes it does. Sometimes somebody, well, there's an accident and the internet is interrupted because the wires are broken. Sometimes some of the backhoes digs a hole to and somebody didn't uh, figure things out. They cut the wire. So the internet can be interrupted. Or any part of the equipment that is smart or that is active can break well, so then you lose the network you lose the connectivity to internet so what happens and i had i was sent through to few of those emergency service calls because wow the skies are falling it's just before christmas and there's internet service that was interrupted to a liquor store right? that's like the end of the world man so what happens do you close the store because you can't do any transactions normally you would but you don't because what happens is there's a backup system with the old dial-up modem, this modem right here, 
which are still being produced, you can buy them new. It switches to that. The service is much slower because every time somebody does a transaction, that modem picks up the telephone line, dials the phone number, then some whatever company service has to pick up, make a handshake signal saying, hi, my name is, uh, I have a transaction to make. Okay, go ahead, transmit, da, da, da. Okay, transmission received, thank you, hang up. Instead of just uh, uh, you swiping the card and this goes like, boom, approved, right? Uh, so the transactions are being slower. And there would be, let's say one cash register that is left open for that purpose. So it switches to emergency backup, dial backup or backup dial. So that one cash register is still open. The lineup would be, well, increasing in people, but still, <clears throat> uh, if somebody is willing to get that bottle of wine and wait in the line, they still can purchase, they still can make a purchase, right? So that's why, that's, and uh, sometimes uh, I would be sent to do the backup dial test regularly by popular, uh, popular <laughs> uh, internet providers or the service providers to the stores and the service call would involve me going in there, getting on the phone with the company and the whole test would be scheduled and that would be sort of like during the slow hours. And uh, we would just go and take this uh, whole thing out of uh, uh, out of service, making sure that the uh, automatic thing is happening because sometimes things getting deprogrammed, they lose their whatever well, programming or whatnot, just to make sure that when the real situation happens, it kicks in. It was just like a backup dial test, right? So that's how the dial-up modems uh, being uh, used. So in this whole presentation, we learned about the coaxial cable and the difference between impedance and characteristic impedance. We talked about multiplexing in a broadband and base band form. All right, this concludes this lesson. We went, whoa, we went a little bit over time. Okay, but remember next week, for this uh, 2023 class of ELEC 1013. Uh, this, uh, there will be no theory classes because that's when you're going to be writing the test. And I will release the test, I don't know, maybe I'll release it over the weekend, maybe I'll release, for sure by Monday, you're going to have the test released with all the explanations on how it can be done. So it's going to be an online test. Make sure you have a good internet connection. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you could uh, write the test. And if you get uh, kicked out from the internet for some reason, you lose connection, do not log in right away because obviously there is a problem. Make sure you get a good connection because you only get two attempts for that reason. And there will be no third attempt. No matter what, hard rule. You're going to have a whole week to write that test, but there are some hard rules that apply also. So don't even ask to change some of that because you're getting really more than enough time to do that. Okay, guys, gals, have a wonderful weekend and don't do anything you wouldn't write home about. Stay healthy and safe, and I'll see you when I see you. Thank you. Close this thing again. <laughs>